Okay, so now um, what I like to do is I like to look at the Targum Jonathan, which is an Aramaic and Rabbinic translation of the book of Isaiah. And so it it is a valuable resource for continuing to study the book of Isaiah. Okay, and, and um, I like to look at the Rabbinic sources too because it helps us to step outside of the box and uh, and just to, to continue studying these scriptures, right? Because you can't get enough, right? Okay, so um, let's look at the, the Targum Jonathan and see what it has to say, what, what Jonathan has to say in, in his translation on Isaiah. Okay, so I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I said unto the seed of the house of Jacob, Seek me reverently in vain. I, the Lord, speak the truth, declaring upright things. Assemble yourselves and come draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations. They know nothing that carry about their wooden images and who pray unto a God who shall not save. Tell ye and draw ye near, yea, take counsel together, who hath declared this from the ancient time, who hath told it from that time. Have not I the Lord, and is and there is no God whatsoever beside me, a just God and a Savior? There is none but I. Turn unto my word, and be ye saved, all that are at the ends of the earth. For I the Lord am the Lord, and there is none else. Right? I am the Lord, there is none else. I have sworn by my word, the word is gone forth in righteousness from my presence, and shall not fail. Okay, now that's, um, I like that verse here. We just underline it. And um, that before me, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. And surely he has promised to me the righteousness and the strength by the word of the Lord. Okay. And in his word, they shall offer praise and all the nations that are incensed against his people shall be ashamed. In the word of the Lord, all the seed of Israel shall be justified and glorified. Okay. So here Isaiah states in verse 19, okay, that God has not spoken in secret, not in a dark place on the earth, but that um, he has said unto the, 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 house, the seed of the house of Jacob. You know, okay, so Israel, it is through Israel that we understand who God is, right? And this through the scriptures, were, and it was through Israel, right? And then, seek me reverently in vain, I the Lord, the true speak truth, the truth, declaring upright things. Okay, so we note how, we'll look at the Targum, we note how the Targum emphasizes the mortality of the God of Israel, or sorry, morality, morality of the God of Israel. And the, I'm saying that because it says here that the Lord, I, the Lord, speak truth declaring upright things okay and so um i'm i'm what i what i was saying was that morals right the morality of the god of israel who declares upright things you know righteous things right not wicked things righteous things and so this is this is a significant difference from the idol gods of the nations and the you know uh, the verse from Targum Jonathan in verse nineteen here and that that's what we got and we got Sepharia's version we got Lagos's version and then these are the Hebrew scriptures here from Sefer Yeshaya and uh, we note that uh, the Isaiah nineteen the jo Targum Jonathan prevents, presents an Aramaic paraphrase of the Hebrew Bible and so uh, in this verse. The Targum emphasizes God's openness and trustfulness, or sorry, truth, truthfulness in communication, contrasting with the secretive oracles of the idols, right, of others' beliefs, right? And the the Aramaic phrase, it says, lo uh, vesitra, that's, that's right here, or la, la vesitra, right? And um, this this phrase means not in secret, you know, underscoring the transparency of God's word to us. You know, God's word has been spoken to us in public and openly and not from a hidden or secret manner. This phrase down here, memalel keshot, okay, uh, this means speaking truth. You know, so again, this highlights the reliability and the honesty of God's message. You know, truth is what establishes justice, you know, and we know how 
truth is get twisted. It's getting twisted today in our country here in the United States. Justice is is going on the wayside. You know, and in addition to this, without truth on how things work, what we have today, like for example, in technology, wouldn't exist. You know, if 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 it wasn't for truth, this technology that we have, you know, this digital pen, this mouse, this computer, this this cell phone, um, wouldn't exist. And the reason is because um, of what the what we see going on today, where people where people can in the liberal uh, in the liberal uh, woke mindset that one plus one can be any number you want. You know, you can be any gender you want. You know, there's not just male and female, which is is what really there are. You know, you can be intergender, you can be bi, trans, you can be um, I don't I don't even know all of them, and it's just so uh, freaky weird. You know, some of the things uh, that they, the, the words they come up with, with some of these, um, these people's, um, and I know bi and uh, trans isn't like a gender thing, um, uh, binary and, you know, stuff like that. Okay. So anyway, you know, the point, the point is, is that uh, these moral relativists, what they want to believe is that one plus one could be anything. You know, again, that's why we had this gender confusion as opposed to one plus one equals two. This is how it works, right? And and this the, this there's this is a significant difference in the way the pagan world functions, even as how the woke liberal ideologies reason that one is correct no matter what the answer is, you know. And it's no wonder the education scores for children across the United States today keeps dropping lower and lower um, in the public schools, you know, because teachers are not maintaining truth and discipline in all areas of their teaching giving precedent to their liberal ideological nonsense. Okay, we note how teachers in the public schools today want to hide these things from parents as well. You know, so this this is this parallels the works of the evil one, right? Just just like what we see here in this text right here where God says that I do not speak in secret, right? But yet you you see the evil one wants the secrets. The evil one wants to hide these things, just like what we see with these teachers wanting to hide things from the parents in, in the public schools. Again, you know, this parallels the work of the evil one. You know, this parallels to what is written in the Targum translation, which contrasts the notion of divine messages, mess, divine messages from hidden or esoteric sources, right? The God of Israel has not hidden his message of truth. He has not hidden his message of justice. He has not hidden his message of salvation. We note also in a New Testament text, like in John 18, 20, it reflects a similar theme where Yeshua spoke of his teachings being delivered openly in the synagogues and in the temple, not in secret. And so again, you know, Yeshua's message aligns with what we see here in Isaiah, Isaiah 45, verse 19. And the Targum emphasizes the clear and public nature of divine, the divine revelation of the God of Israel, right, to us, right? And we note, we note, let's know what uh, the commentators have to say. You know, for example, May HaShiloach has to, has to say concerning these things. So, um, right here, a lot, uh, big text here. I'm kind of in front of it. But, um... Let me read what it says. Give me a second here. Okay. So um, it says, If you say in your hearts, these nations are more powerful than I, how, can, how shall I inherit them? Do not fear them. Remember uh, what, okay, so remember what, remember well, what Hashem your God did to Pharaoh and all of Egypt. And how, and then it's Deuteronomy 7. Okay how it is possible to warn of something that happens of its own accord without the input of man's will and command concerning it. Be not afraid. Will not the heart fear it anyway as it is out of our hands? Yet we find that the contents of a man's heart are known through his actions. Okay. And by means of the meat's vote, okay, of the meat's vote, the depth of his heart will become clear. Exactly what the book of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 4, right? The discerner of, of the intentions of the heart, right? Okay, so for example, one who does not rule over his fellow, even though it is written, 
his power to do so. From this, we see that he fears God. If he adorns the mitzvot, hidor mitzvot, to a higher degree, as our sages have said, this is proof that he loves God from the depth of his heart, not superficially. And similarly, here God warned of the necessity to remove illusion from the heart of Israel. And truly the heart of Israel contains a special power, so it is necessary to remove the illusion from their heart. For in truth, God does not desire that we fear anything illusory. This is as it is written in Isaiah 49, 19. I have not said to the seed of Jacob, seek me in tohu, right? In in void, in the void, you know, tohu of ohu from uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. God, um, in the beginning, God created and the earth was tohu of ohu. It was void without form. Okay, so um, tohu means the fear. Okay, you know it. This draws us right back to the creation account. It draws us back to the power and the glory of God, right? It's who he is, his Lord over all. You know how it just these things just... Anyway, so tohu means the fear of the illusory, and a man must know that there is a force running the world, and he wants his creations to have a calm mind. That which he warned here, do not fear them, means not the fear of the superficial, the illusions of the surface, as it explained on the verse, when you see the horse and the chariots, the people more powerful than you. Okay, so major conclusion from this commentary is that fear, especially fear of the illusory or superficial, is not a desired state according to God's will. So we note that we are not to be superficial in our understanding of God and the application of Scripture. And this implies that we are to be reading God's Word daily. And we note that when we live our lives according to the commands, we get a better understanding of who God is and an understanding of His holy and righteous ways. We get a better understanding of who we are and we realize how, how, what kind of sinners we are, you know, how we prefer not to do these things. We prefer not to live in God's righteousness and holy ways. We, you know, we need God's help. This is, you know, obeying Torah does so much for us in our relationship and our life with the Lord, you know, in the Lord and in Yeshua, you know, it's amazing. And so, again, you know, the, what the commentary is saying, don't be superficial in our understanding of God in the application of Scripture. And this implies that we are to be, again, you know, reading daily. We note that when we live according to the commands, we get better understanding, right, of God. And the rabbinic literature suggests that true faith and trust in God are demonstrated through action and adherence to the mitzvot, to the commandments, which reveal the depth of one's heart, the truthfulness of one's intentions. Again, you know, this is what the author of the book of Hebrews wrote in Hebrews chapter 4. You know, check it out. And the rabbis emphasize that God's followers should not fear the seemingly more powerful nations as this fear is considered an illusion, right? And because of the power of God is so mighty, it is so great, right? Instead, they should remember God's past deeds and have confidence in his continued guidance and support. You know, we are to trust in the power of God to overcome our enemies, right? And so... This teaching relates to Isaiah 45, 19, where God declares, and we saw, we see right here is where they cite that verse, right? 45, 19. And it implies um, the, uh, well, okay, the teaching uses this verse where God declares that he did not speak in secrecy or instruct the descendants of Jacob to seek him in vain. The verse in um 45.19 implies that God's communication is clear, it is truthful, and meant to guide his people in faithfulness towards righteousness and a calm state of mind, free from chaos, of the woke, free from the woke ideologies, free from depression and, and baseless fears, right? God's word destroys the idolatry of woke liberalism. And this is why we are they are they are so bent against the word of God to keep it out of the hands of children. This is why they're going to such great extent to develop policy and curriculum to get it into children's heads as young as they can, because they know when they do that, it will lock in, okay? And that um, this is why liberal ideology or idolatry is doing this. this is why these these evil forces that are at work behind these things are doing these things today and they want to destroy lives they want to destroy children and again you know these 
things remind us that we have to take a stand against falsehoods. You know, the scriptures encourage individuals to focus on what is truly important, which is to be faithful in deed and in action and in trust in the Lord God of Israel, rather than being swayed by fears or external appearances that may lead one astray. You know, so this, this, this scripture here uh, calls for a life lived in alignment with God's commands, with a heart free from illusions, recognizing that God's guidance is straightforward and aimed at well being for his followers. You know, this, this perspective can lead to a, a more focused, you know, and purposeful life. This is why when, when they do surveys, they see that conservative uh, Christian uh, men, women, and children are the most well-adjusted, are the least depressed, you know? And this is why the world is so depressed and so just out of their minds when it comes to almost everything, you know, you think about it. And so, um, this, this, this you know, I'm getting off track here, <laughs> getting emotional on this, but um, this, we gotta, we gotta realize what we realize according to God, God's word in the scriptures here is that uh, God wants for our good. You know, he, he wants for us to have a fulfilled life, a meaningful life, a life of meaning and purpose that is focused on him and his glory, right? And grounded in, in spiritual clarity and moral integrity. You know, so this approach to faith and life brings great joy and peace to our lives. We note again how this stands in contrast to the lives of those who are in bondage. And I'm talking significant bondage to the LGBTQ sinful lifestyles, including the chaos of not knowing who one is, whether one's one gender or what, what gender or what, you know, binary and, you know, whatever, right? That's, that's chaos. That, that's confusion. God doesn't want that for your life. God doesn't want this for our lives. You know, the evil one wants to confuse. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy. That's what the scriptures say. He wants to distort perception of reality. Okay? The God of Israel, on the other hand, wants to bring clarity. This is what he's declaring right here in the Hebrew and the Aramaic text. God wants to bring clarity to his people and to every man, woman, and child on this earth, you know, and he wants to bring truth. He wants to bring righteousness to all who are willing to seek him in his holy and righteous ways. You know, this, this stability and clarity and purpose, all of these things come when we read God's word and when we take it to heart, we apply it to our lives, right? We believe in the Messiah, Yeshua, right? You know, there, there is, there is truth to these things. There's a lot of truth to these things. Now, let's look at another commentary. Um, what does another commentary say concerning these things? Okay, so let's look at that uh, right here. And this is from Man and God, chapter seven, Sedek and Sadak. Okay, so Sedek is uh, righteousness. Okay. It says, however, if tzedek is a divine disposition to create with the purpose of good in view, and okay, we look at the creation account. Everything God created, and it was good. That's what he said. So God's creative purpose is for good. And so when he creates in us something new, he transforms us into something new. It is for good, right? And so this, this is consistent with the Torah context, right? We see the New Testament context. We know what Paul says in Corinthians, right, in Romans concerning the new man, right? That, that what God does in us and in his people, right? And so we, you can see this continuity, right, in, in who God is, what the God of Israel wants for us, right? Okay, so um, it, the rabbis are saying here, if righteousness, if divine righteousness to create is for the purpose of good. Okay, that's what it's saying here. Then we are led to the conclusion that tzedek, ontologically speaking, is the principle of identity between being and value in its efficacious mightiness. Okay, so right there is purpose and worth. You know how 
Do you know how worth we, how much value that we have in the eyes of God? We have so much value that he sent his son to die for us in the most horrible, excruciating way on the cross, right? That's how much God loves us, okay? And then it goes on and says, we have shown how this identity between being and value comes to the expression in Isaiah 45, 18 and 19. The understanding of the identity of being and the good of the and the and okay of being and the good and then tohu quality of evil okay and uh you you talking vain confusion chaos void nothingness that's what tohu is right and it's it's equating it with evil is how the rabbis are looking at and then they said this is essential for the application of the biblical idea of redemption and indeed the messianism of the hebrew bible okay so we may be uh we may best illustrate our point by discussing a comment of saint snaith this is what he has to say about sedekas okay so you know it's an interesting short blurb here from the rabbinic commentaries you know the major conclusion of this rabbinic commentary is that the identity between being, which is existence, and value, which is self-worth, is essential for understanding the biblical idea of redemption. We notice how these things speak to the great value of wor and worth of each individual in this world. This means that we cannot, we we are not to be insecure in ourselves. But we are to realize how much value we have to God, right? This commentary speaks of the divine attribute of righteousness, tzedek, which, which gives one great value since this is connected to what is moral and what is good. You know, because morality and goodness has great value. You know, th this is how Isaiah 49, or sorry, 45 verse 19 speaks concerning these things that god has not spoken in secret or tohu right chaos emptiness void and so this emphasizes the love of god in righteousness and truth you know the understanding of righteousness is a principle that unites us and underlies the biblical narrative on redemption you know this suggests that god's actions and existence are inherently good and just, and that evil represented by tohu is contrary to God's nature. Remember how we had discussed in a previous study how the pagan religions have their gods coming forth from tohu, which represents evil, right? The chaos, they come out, they just, they just popped out of the chaos, right? And uh, so this, I felt that this provides a lot of context on the idol gods of the nations and again, how Tohu certainly does represent evil because of the chaos and confusion that sin brings to one's life, such as in the gender confusion movement, movement men thinking they're girls, women thinking they're boys, utter confusion on who one is created to be, right? And the, the same can also be said of homosexuality and the trans movement and men and women going after the same sex. You know, again, this is a form of confusion that is readily demonstra um, demonstrable in the LGBT community. Okay, now according to the scriptures, God speaks of righteousness and things that are upright. The text implies that God's communication and actions are transparent and aimed at achieving what is good and of great value in our lives, right? So, you know, we note how, the God, how much value the God of Israel brings to our lives, what he expects for us of, of living in peace and in righteousness to all men, right? And look at, look at Islam. Look how wicked that, that religion is, filled with hate and murder, right? That's all it is. If you just, all we got to do is look, turn on the TV, you know? It's everywhere. Look at Michigan. You know, it's crazy. You know, and then people are, are, are um, they're, they're going to this religion in droves, you know, in mass. Why? Because it is a religion of flesh. It is a religion of the flesh and of pride and of arrogance. And again, you know, these are the things that our body wants. These are the things that, that, um, we want, and the, 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 the desire for us should be that 
God would help us to live for his glory, not be prideful, not to be living in the flesh, right? Not to be, uh, not to be doing these things. And, and this is why there is such this, this huge contrast between the religions, right? And the God of Israel, right? And his Messiah, Yeshua, right? It, huge, huge worlds apart contrast between these things, right? And according to the, to the scriptures, God speaks of righteousness and things that are upright. Remember, we we saw that you know here, you know the, these things are, that are upright. Um, right here, it goes, um, "I, the Lord, speak righteousness, and that is what is upright." Right, and so that implies God's communication, who He is, His actions. They're transparent. They're aimed at what is good and of great value for our lives. You know, how much more should we we seek these things? How much more should we seek the God of Israel and his, his Messiah, Yeshua, right? This challenges the notion of the hidden deity and the confusion of this world today. You know, Isaiah presents a God whose purpose is the establishment of good and justice in the world. We notice how contrary this is, again, to Islam, you know, which uh, operates, they do not know the truth and they do not have justice. You know, all they want is power. They want to rule and they want to sin, right? And then we note, um, like in the October um, 7th incident in 2023, you know, that uh, it demonstrates these things in Hamas's murder, rape, torture, killing of the innocents, killing babies, you know, burning in fire, microwaving ovens. You know, there's video of that online. You can see it. You can find it. You know, it's absolutely horrid, awful, you know, and Islam has, Islam has no sense of what is moral or correct or right, right? And this religion feeds the flesh. It is a spirituality of the devil, okay? So the application of this, of this scripture from Isaiah here to our lives involves recognizing and aligning ourselves with this principle of tzedek, right, of righteousness, which is God calling us to live in a way that reflects his righteousness, seeking to embody the values that are in harmony with the essential nature of the God of Israel that is found in the commandments. And then, then Yeshua helps us, right? And when we have faith in him, our Father sends the Holy Spirit into our lives, empowering us to live for him, right? And this means then when we receive the presence of God in our lives, and we believe in the Messiah Yeshua by faith, and we pursue justice, we act with integrity, and we can and um, we contribute to the redemption and betterment of the world. You know, like in, in Judaism, it says Tikkun Olam, right? And following the example set by our servant, um, or by sorry, not our servant, by the servant King Messiah of God Yeshua. Okay, so um, now um, let's move off of verse 19. <laughs> and then um, I promise it's a little shorter for the rest. Um, so let's look at, you know, 20, 21, and 22. Okay, here. And so it says, these verses say, Assemble yourselves and come draw near together. Ye that are escaped of the nations, they know nothing that carry about their wooden images and who pray unto a God who shall not save them. Tell ye and draw ye near, ye take counsel together, who hath declared this from ancient time, who hath told it from that time, hath not I the Lord, and there is no God beside me, just a just God and a Savior, there is none but I. Uh, turn unto my word, and be ye saved, all that are at the ends of the earth, for I am the Lord, and there is none else. Okay, so... Here, you know, it's interesting because it says in verse 22, it says, turn uh, le memory, you know, turn to my word, right? Turn to my word, right? God's always asking us to turn somewhere towards him, towards his word, away from sin, right? We note how in Isaiah 45, verse 22 in the Targum, and it speaks of this turning to my word. And if we believe what is written in John chapter 1, verses 1 to 14, this is telling us to turn to Yeshua, the Messiah, and be saved. You know, 
Um, the Aramaic translation of these verses here, uh, the Targum differs only slightly from the Hebrew Bible. And the main difference is in this translation here where I got highlighted. And it says, and there is no Ella, you know, God besides me. And there is none besides me and there is none like me. Okay, so this, this translation emphasizes, um, it places emphasis on God's uniqueness and power can inspire a deeper sense of awe, reverence, and trust in God and His Messiah. And so these scriptures, they also encourage believers to seek the servant King Messiah and His word, right? And uh, His guidance, His protection, knowing that He is the one whom God has brought to help and to save, right? So these are the specific New, Par New Testament parallels. You know, there, there are um, parallels to these verses here. The themes of God's uniqueness, and the importance of seeking his help are present and throughout the New Testament text. You know, for example, in John 14, 6, Yeshua said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You know, so again, you know, this verse underscores the exclusivity of the Messiah of God as the only way to salvation, echoing the emphasis on God's uniqueness, like what we're seeing here in Isaiah 45, verses 20 through 22. Okay, now, another commentary states the following about these verses. Okay, so let's look at what it says here. And this is um, Stein Zaltz on Isaiah 45, 22. And it says, therefore, turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. Okay, so again, you know, you got the rabbis, they're recognizing that what the Hebrew text actually states is all the ends of the earth. And these uh, modern scholars, pfft, you know, just disregard them, you know, because they're probably just trying to looking for research money to keep keep uh keep their research work going okay and so they make up all this stuff but anyway so it says therefore unto me turn unto me and be saved all the day all the ends of the earth for i am god and there is no other there is there is no other source of salvation my divinity is independent of nationality and location one may not turn to idols even in the most isolated okay even in the most isolated corner of the earth okay so Steinsalt ex emphasizes the idea that God is the only source of salvation. And as stated, it says, for I am God and there is no other. And this highlights the belief in monotheism, right? And the exclusive power of God to save and redeem those who seek him. You know, there is a clear denunciation of idol worship and asserting that this command against idolatry is not confined to a specific location on earth. And he says, even to the remotest, most isolated point on, or corner of the earth, okay, do not serve idols, right? And so uh, turning to idols is futile, even in the remotest of places on the earth. You know, God sees, you know, and this highlights God's sovereignty and his transcendence over human categories such as nationality and location and pointing to the Creator God who exists and is not limited to a geography or an ethnicity or a nationality, etc. You know, all men, women, and child, children are accountable to the God of Israel. And regardless of where, they're, where they are located on earth, regardless of their heritage, and um, for example, the people from which they come, right? We note how Stein, Steinsalt's commentary warns against turning to idols highlights the importance of avoiding idolatry and maintaining a strong connection with the God of Israel, regardless of one's location or one's circumstance. So this directs us to understand God's plan for salvation, how his salvation is available to the ends of the earth, indicating a sense of both, uh, for both Jew and Gentile in um, Jewish theology, you know? So what we have here is in this Jewish theology, uh, salvation for Jew and Gentile, right? And, you know, you, there's parallels in the New Testament text, and this is consistent with Paul's understanding of the scriptures and God's plan for salvation, that God's saving power is not limited to a specific group or, or location, but is available to all who seek him in the Messiah Yeshua. We note also this is why the Jerusalem Council advised the Gentile believers to avoid idolatry and food sacrifice to idols and so forth, as we read in Acts chapter 15. Okay, and so the, these things, again, they're all consistent with the scripture, with all of scripture from, from beginning in. 
book of Genesis, the book of Revelation. Okay, so now let's look at the last of these verses here. And so 23 to 25, it says, I have sworn by my word, the word has gone forth in righteousness from my presence and shall not fail, that before me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Surely he has promised to bring me righteousness and strength by the word of the Lord. In his word, they shall offer praise, and all the nations that are incensed against his people shall be ashamed. And in the word of the Lord, all the seed of Israel shall be justified and glorified. Okay, so interesting feature on the Aramaic text is what we see right here. And it says, Bememory Kaimat. Okay, and that, that is... Uh, by my word, it is established. Okay, so this highlights the power and the authority of God's word where God says in, in the Masoretic text, he says, be nishbati, you know, I swear in myself, right? By myself, I declare, I swear, right? And, and it means that God, there is, there is no higher authority, right? And it, it speaks to his faithfulness. Right, and this aligns with the Hebrew Bible's emphasis on the irrevocable nature of God's declarations. Right, by my word, it has been established. Right, and the Targum Jonathan on memory of the of the Lord. Okay, so um, and I didn't have that one highlighted. Um, but it translates the word of the Lord, which is uh, reflects this theological concept where memra is often used to personify God's word. Okay, when we look at the we look at the Aramaic Targum, you know, you can see this really well in the book of Genesis and the creation account in Genesis chapter three, you know, and so forth, uh, how the word of God is personified. You know, for example, in the cool of the day, the word, the memory of the Lord was walking in the, the garden, right? And uh, so we see that the, the, there is this, this theological concept in uh, the Aramaic text, how the memory, the word is personified for the presence of God, you know, indicating a divine agency in creation and in revelation, right? We know how John takes the same approach in his description of Yeshua according to John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and then it goes on, and it's the Word came and dwelled among flesh and tabernacled among men, right? And it paraphrase <laughs> from memory here. But um, Yeshua, right? And so this this is uh, this is how we see this continuity between like the Aramaic text, right, and the New Testament text. Okay, so um, in the Masoretic text, the Hebrew word for all is translated the same, all. Okay, so you you can see right here, call and call, right, and so uh, it, here it says in Aramaic. All who bless will be blessed, right? And um, this change in translation, okay. So this is uh, there is a there is a change in translation here, and this means that to take refuge, you know, that that like for example here, um, to take refuge in the Lord, right? This emphasis on the change in translation is that. Uh, the idea of seeking refuge and protection from God. You know, overall, the differences in translation affect the interpretation and application by providing more explicit connection between God's word and action, reinforcing the idea that God's promises are certain and they will come to pass. And so again, you know, when we, when we look at the Aramaic text, it encourages us in our faith and our trust in God's word and its revel relevance to our lives. Okay. Now, um, in terms of the New Testament parallels to these verses, the concept of every knee bowing and every, knee, every tongue confessing is echoed in Philippians chapter 2, 
where it is applied to Yeshua, the servant King Messiah, suggesting a continuity of God's plan from the Hebrew Bible through the New Testament text. And we also see the idea of all the nations coming to the knowledge of God being echoed in the New Testament, like in Romans 15, verse 9, which quotes Isaiah 11, verse 10, and states that the Gentiles will glorify God for his mercy. You know, secondly, the idea of blessing and salvation have been extended to all nations is also found in the New Testament, such as in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, which describe a, uh, a vision of people from every nation, tongue, and tribe, right? T tribe and tongue and language, right? And worshiping God, right, in heaven. And finally, the idea of all people being established in God is reflected in the New Testament emphasis on the importance of faith in the servant King Messiah for salvation. You know, as we see in Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 9, which states that it is by grace that we are saved through faith and not by works. You know, overall, the New Testament parallels to the Aramaic translation on Isaiah 45, verses 23 to 25 here, uh, emphasize the universal nature of God's salvation. That's the salvation of God is offered to all peoples, and it is calling all peoples to repentance, to faith, and to faithfulness to the God of Israel and his Messiah. You know, to turn from idolatry, turn from sin, turn to the God of Israel, right? Now, Rashi's commentary says the following and about these things. Okay, so it says, But to me did he say by the Lord, okay, and but by the Lord to me, he said, this verse is inverted, and thus it is interpreted, but to me did he say by the Lord righteousness and strength, although all the nations shall prostrate themselves before him, but to me alone, the congregation of Israel has been promised by the Lord righteousness and strength, and other nations shall not be included in my glory. To him shall come and be ashamed all who are incensed uh, against the Holy One, blessed be he, shall come to him to regret what they did in their lifetime and be ashamed. And all who are incensed, all who are incensed. Okay, so Rashi provides an interpretation in three parts. Okay, so you got... You got um, you got part one, part two, and part three. Okay, that's where um, one through three here. Okay, so he discusses righteousness and strength by explaining that this verse is inverted and should be understood as God promising righteousness and strength to Israel alone. Now, even though all the nations would prostrate before him. And so the difficulty is that there must be a fundamental change in the lives of the nations for God to give righteousness and strength to Gentiles, okay, the this fundamental change is to be transformed within, to turn from idolatry, to seek the God of Israel and his righteous, righteousness. You know, so these things are promised to Israel, receiving righteousness and strength in the Torah, but this was not extended to the nations in the Torah. And so here in Isaiah, he prophesies that ultimately God will cause this blessing to fall upon all the nations. You know, the first part is to recognize that sin, recognize sin for what it is, you know, in one's life and to regret one's actions and to perform teshuvah, to repent, right? And the recognition of sin is the acknowledgement of God's sovereignty and need for forgiveness. Rashi speaks of incensed individuals, who, which refers to those who challenge or oppose God. You know, Rashi clarifies that it speaks about individuals who are defiant against God Rashi's commentary ex emphasizes the unique relationship between God and Israel, and as Isaiah states, that eventual recognition of God's authority by those who oppose him and the consequences of defiance, right? And so the one who turns from sin and turns to the God of Israel to walk in his holy and righteous ways, there is a great joy in doing these things and in the realization that the God in heaven has forgiven our sins. This is what the commentary, um, this is the same thing that the commentary Olat Raya states, according to this verse, is from Isaiah. And this is the last we're looking at tonight. Okay. So um, let me read through this and see what it has to say. Okay. So, uh, rather, while immersed in the joy of the mitzvah, right? So the joy of Torah, right? And um, so the commandments are not something that are uh, burdensome. They are a joy, right? Okay. So a mitzvah comes to realize also outside of the soul of the one who performs it. In truth, joy is a sensation of inner wholeness, which the upright soul feels in the rightness of her path and its goodness. And in that prayer is a choice of fruit of time. 
and its purpose in her soul, perfection. It is fitting that it reveal itself to the pleasure of a whole inner life, to the joy of the mitzvah, the commandment, right? Our sages teach one who pray who prays must direct his heart towards heaven. Abba Shaul says, a sign for this is you will prepare your heart, you will cause your ear to hear. There is a particular kavanah, right, intention, which is alignment with the meaning of the words and ideas of prayer. There is all inclusive kavanah, right, which is in alignment with the heart and the greatness of God and the soul's elevation suitable to her illumination, but a light of God for which the hour of prayer is uniquely favorable. This is what we learn here, that aside from aligning with the words and ideas and their particularity, one must direct or align their heart with heaven and loftiness of God to the extent that their soul can bear. And through the remembering of God and his greatness, the soul is lifted up to the wholeness of prayers of purpose, which of necessity aids its acceptance. And Abba Shaul said that this is what prepare your hearts means, that through remembering God, their hearts are prepared for justice and re, 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 uh, rectitude, like the words of Rabbeinu Yonah on the verse, it is through the Lord that all the offspring of Israel have vindicated in glory, have vindication in glory. There he says that through recalling God, the seed of Israel becomes righteous and praiseworthy because through this collection, their soul is lifted up to every good trait, to every practical capability and heart's wisdom. And so God is the one who prepares their hearts because their hearts are lifted up to a great things through the remembering of him. Okay, so um, one of the reasons why I wanted to include this commentary, you note that the rabbis believe that it is the Lord God who prepares our hearts, right? And um, then it goes on, and, and through this you will cause your ear to hear. This teaches that aside from the particular kavanah, that is exactly primary. The all-inclusive kavana is certainly required. This type of kavana is indicated by prepare his heart in heaven. It aids the acceptance. So, and, okay, and then here they say, and through this, you will cause your ear to hear. Okay, so the idea is that the Lord God is the one who is enabling, right? Okay, so this commentary offers insights on the nature of, of the mitzvot, the commands, and prayer. Okay, so the major conclusions drawn from the text are that a mitzvah extends beyond the individual soul, suggesting that the mitzvah has a has a tangible, the commandment has a tangible influence on the world. Okay, so true joy is described as a feeling of completeness and an upright soul experiences when following a righteous path, indicating that spiritual fulfillment is linked to moral living. Okay, so Joy and fulfillment is linked to moral living. You know, prayer is considered the highest use of time and is expressed through the joy that one feels in living a life that is aligned with God. Okay, so again, you know, we're talking about those who walk according to God's word, not living in sin. Remember Psalm 66, 18. David said that if I sin, you will not hear me, right? He, prayer, when one, if one sins, God does not hear, you know, outside of the prayer of repentance and teshuvah, right? And so, this is what David was saying. This appears to be what the rabbis are saying here. And from the sense that if um, that uh, moral, li upright living is aligning our lives with God, his word, and it brings joy to our lives, and that it... it uh, helps us to direct our heart towards heaven during prayer, right? Implying a need, um, in, in implying that uh, if we're sinning, you know, for example, that is where our heart's directed to, right? Oh, oh forgive me, please, Lord, have mercy on me, you know, and um, help me to turn from these, you know, this wicked way, you know, and stuff like that, right? And as opposed to if we're walking in righteousness or, or you know, we're we're praying for other things. And, um these things imply that we, there is a need for uh, emotional and spiritual focus when speaking with God. You know, the act of remembering God's greatness prepares the heart for justice and righteousness, leading to a state where one is prepared to live one's life for the Lord. You know, keeping God's commands also enables the Lord God to hear our prayers. You know, like in Psalm 66, 18, the prayer is coupled with obedience in the power of God to work in the lives of his people. You know, the commentary states that God is the one who prepares 
their hearts. He prepares our hearts. Again, this is a significant observation, since it is the Lord God who is working in one's life to change one from the inside out. You know, this is consistent with what we were reading in the book of Isaiah. This is consistent with what we read in the New Testament text, you know, concerning the nations. And we note how this is consistent um, with the New Testament rendition of Yeshua the Messiah, the, the servant king Messiah, Yeshua. You know, so these things emphasize the importance of our intentions, having faith and being faithful. And the same thing that Isaiah is speaking of back in his day are the same things that we need in our lives today. Again, you know, the, these things illustrate the timelessness of the scriptures and uh, the, how God's word is timeless, right? It is. It has application for life and for our lives, no matter where we are in the history of mankind. Okay, so um, that's what I had for the study for tonight. Uh, thank you for staying the entire time. If you stayed the entire time, I appreciate that. Next week, we will start Isaiah chapter 46. Okay, so thanks for listening. Bye.